Today I pose the question and hopefully answer what might future lawyers be doing. If you enrol as a law student in 2016, you will be graduating in 2019-2020. In but first, what do you think lawyers uh, might be doing in the future in 2020? Funny wigs and gavels, imposing courthouses and courtroom dramas, forms, paperwork, family conflict and dispute, or you might think about rights and justice, let's hope not Saul Goodman type characters. In fact, law students and lawyers are moving into a changed world. There are really, it's quite a, a volatile environment. The types of law firms are changing in this globalising world into transnational conglomerates, such as Dentons and Daisheng, a Chinese-based firm that employs 6,500 lawyers in over 50 countries. We have increasing costs in, in higher education with a, a degree in law about $10,000 a year in a regional university. We have uncertain employment prospects with a quarter of law students in 2014 uh, having to wait four months before they got full-time employment. We have evidence of work-life balance uh, issues around anxiety and depression. Uh, it's well known that law professionals and law students uh, have higher rates of anxiety and depression than the average population. We have women in the workforce also leaving after five years of practice. And this is in a uh, Australian workplace environment in which bullying is on the rise with six, uh, Australia being ranked six out of 31 European countries for bullying. That may all sound a little depressing, however, it's not all bad news. We do know that uh, university graduates earn more over their lifetime and certainly there is a demand for law professionals in Australia. In uh, 2014, 49% of the population sought legal advice and 22% of the population came in contact with the law on three or more occasions. One of the most important observations to make is that there is a, a revolutionary transformation going on in the way the common law adversarial style of justice is delivered, with now around 98% of matters being resolved outside of the courtroom. So these matters are being resolved in a growing system of tribunals and using other conflict resolution methods. In fact, this is an integrative rather than a competitive approach to resolving conflicts. An example of this is in 2013-14, uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman resolved 11,000 matters uh, using mediation alone. So how is it that law schools are still using a positive case-based uh, adversarial approach in their focus in training? Currently, an Australian tertiary law degree requires study in 11 core areas. These are often referred to as the Priestley 11, as it was Chief Justice uh, Priestley who headed the Law Admissions Consultative Committee in 1994 that came up with these core areas. They have remained unchanged and so they are current today some 20 years later. One addition is the practical legal training course that is required to be completed usually in about 15 weeks. With that and your law degree and good character, then you can become a practising legal professional. You will not see anywhere in that list mention of training in alternative dispute resolution. However, there are growing calls in Australia for that to be the case, to prepare graduates for a collaborative world in which they are expected to work in. An adversarial lawyer is not focused on the emotional costs or the underlying human issues. Instead, they are focused on the end point, and that's usually resolution with a financial outcome. 
So I'm asking why then is a law curriculum still having over 95% of its focus on adversarial style lawyering when 98% of disputes are resolved using these non-adversarial collaborative methods? I'm not saying that we don't need to train litigious lawyers. We certainly need them. They have a special role. But what I am saying is the curriculum is currently considerably out of balance. The future is collaborative non-adversarial lawyering. And so you might ask, what is it that I'm talking about when I suggest this? Well, a brief lesson in ADR. I'm actually an adversarial trained lawyer and mother of a girl and a boy. And let's say they are disputing over the one unfortunate orange left in the bowl. As that adversarial trained lawyer, I may say, well, what is the resolution of it? It's based on fairness. There's one orange, I cut it in half. So I have son and daughter both 50% happy and 50% unhappy. I could say, uh, based on rights, oh, son, you are the eldest, you get the, uh, the orange, and daughter, you get nothing. I have one child 100% satisfied, the other 100% unsatisfied. There is a third way, and this is the collaborative integrative way, where I pose some more questions or I engage with some dialogue and discussion with them to find out why it is, what are their interests, why do they want the orange? And I find out then that my son has been told by his coach that he needs to drink freshly squeezed orange juice every morning for his new football training regime and the daughter needs the orange peel for the cake that she's baking for the charity. Through this, it is a relational process where I've sought dialogue and collaboration between the parties looking to resolve their conflict in good faith in order to satisfy the interests of both. A winner in legal terms is often a euphemism in which the outcome may take many years and involve a lot of personal stress, loss of personal and business relationships and certainly a huge financial burden. And you don't know what the outcome may be until that third independent person has given you a resolution. With collaborative processes, you're engaged in that process and in deciding what will be the best outcome for both of you. So in teaching this in the, in the law course, you are encouraging students to develop an integrative, facilitative thinking style that can soften the blunt edge of this competitiveness. You improve social cohesion through engagement in the classroom and your learning approach, which is often in involving role plays and teamwork and strong interpersonal communication skills. So when teaching uh, dispute resolution courses like this, you actually learn about conflict theory, which you don't learn in any other law courses. And you learn that conflict can have a, a very positive outcome. And it's not just about the winner. Uh, conflict can uh, lead to growth and improvement. So training in emotional awareness and empathy can only assist in improving self-awareness around work-life balance and ethical behaviours and interpersonal deeper communication to help uh, overcome some of those uh, rather depressing facts that I mentioned at the beginning, such as bullying, anxiety and uh, depression, with having this greater depth of awareness of interpersonal communication skills, it is hoped that these graduates would be better able to cope in that work environment. So essentially I am arguing the current training of lawyers is outdated and does not fit well with the future demands on graduates. By placing ADR as a core in the curriculum, it will balance it in a way that whether we're looking at transnational legal conglomerates or the small local uh, community level of lawyering, students will be adaptable, they will have self-awareness and an ability to ensure work-life balance and hopefully a wellness that arises from a more holistic training that incorporates emotional uh, sensitivity and respect for the individual. They will be legal graduates ready for the future. Mm -hmm.